2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says, wherefore henceforth, some way to talk, Paul. Know we no man how after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man beware in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself. How? By Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us this word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye what? Reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. May God add a blessing to the readers and the hearers and most of all, the doers of his word. Just for a moment, I want to try to develop a thought from the subject, naturally inconvenient. Naturally inconvenient. Come on, say it with me. Say eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive all of the wonderful things that Christ has already done. Let's pray. Father, bless you. Thank you. We give you glory today, God, for being such an awesome and wonderful God to us. Thank you now, God, for we've had moments of worship. We've had moments of praise, for you deserve all the praise, the honor, the worship, and the glory. But, God, we ask now that you would allow your spirit, Holy Ghost, come into this place. Speak to us. Challenge us. Change us. Transform us by your word so that we can become men and women that live lives that bring you glory. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke every demon, devil, foul spirit, every wicked thing. Father, we plead the blood of Jesus on the life of your people and everything that they are connected to. Holy Ghost, come in and transform our lives. And when you've done it, you get the praise, the honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Somebody say, thank God. Amen. Naturally inconvenient. Can we just have a, a, a conversation today? Just a little, a little discussion. A little discussion. Um, some of you might agree, some of you might disagree, but there are certain things that we could say is natural. Right? Just certain elements, or things that are in existence in our lives that are natural. What I mean when I say natural, I'm saying things that just are as a result of nature. Not anything that we've done, right? They're just natural. It's, it's that way. It's common. It's normal. It's ordinary, right? Naturally, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It's not something we have to think about every morning. We don't have to go on our iPhone and tell Siri to set an alarm so we can go and turn the sun on in the morning. Okay, that one is way out of our range. Uh, there are some things also that are natural for us, like breathing. Amen. We don't have to tell Siri to set an alarm to remind us to breathe. Praise the Lord. There's also natural things like blinking. So it's just natural. Things that are common and ordinary that we're used to, that we don't even have to put forth any effort Come on, little to no effort for these things to happen and take place. Then there's inconveniences or things that are inconvenient, meaning things that creates trouble in our lives, creates distractions, diversions, delay, or discomfort in our lives. Come on, somebody. All right, inconvenient. You, you know, convenience costs. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Convenience costs. There is a premium that must be paid 
for a convenience. Y'all don't believe me. Leave out of this church this afternoon when we're done here and get on precinct line. And I want you to drive north and you'll find a quick trip or a QT on the northeast corner of Highway 121 and Precinct Line Road. I want you to go into that QT and get a 16 ounce bottle of Ozarka water. And you're likely to pay somewhere between 99 and a dollar and 29 cents for that 16 ounce bottle of water. Then I want you to go just a few blocks north to the Walmart and go into the beverage or the drink section and you'll find that a case of Ozarka is probably like $4. Y'all ain't saying amen. So you saying I can get 36 times, oh, I'm preaching, the amount that I got in the convenience store if I just take a little more time to go the long way. The hard way. Or the, I'm preaching better. Thank you, Holy. That wasn't even in the deal. What I'm trying to say to you, the Holy Ghost is saying, if you would just take a little more time and do it my way. Oh, oh, I know it might be a little inconvenient for you to pray for her, but if you would just go ahead and do it my way. Oh, I know it might put you out and delay you a little bit for you to say good morning to him, but if you just do it, y'all ain't going to say amen. I know you want to get to your bed and get to your sleep, but if you would just take a little time to get on your face before me, I know it's inconvenient for you. Ain't nobody going to say amen, but I promise you, you'll get 36 times what you would have gotten. Oh, God, well, then nobody want that. Let me go back to what I was supposed to be preaching. So there are things that are natural, there's things that are inconvenient, but then there's things that are naturally inconvenient. Meaning that they're just naturally incompatible and inconsistent with other things. You don't have to do anything to make them not fit. They just naturally don't fit. Do I have a witness? Some of us are in relationships. That naturally <laughs> don't fit. So when I, when I was thinking about this, I began to think about the nature, the attributes and the character of God. God is, God is. He, he never was and never will be. He just is. Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning, God. So whenever it started, whatever started, however it started, God was already there. He just is. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, not only is God uh, ever present, not only is he ever existent, but God is omnipotent. Meaning that he is all powerful. There is nothing that God cannot do. There is nothing that is too hard for God. There is no enemy. There is no adversary. There is no challenge. There is no opposition that God cannot overcome. I wish I had somebody. There are powers, but he is all powerful. God Almighty. God is omnipotent. Not only is God omnipotent, but he's omniscient. Meaning that God already knows. He didn't have to find out or to discover or learn. He already knows. God, are you hearing what I'm saying? God is omniscient. He knows all. He's omnipresent. He sees all. God is holy. God is righteous. God is full of grace. He's full of mercy and truth. These are things that we, through his word, can learn and know about God. But not only is God omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, holy, righteous, full of grace, full of mercy, and full of love, and full of truth, but even Jesus is very much the same. In fact, in fact, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, watch this text, watch John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Watch verse 2. And the same was in the beginning with God. So that means Jesus just is. God is, and Jesus just is. Watch, watch this. Watch this next verse. Verse 3 says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Uh-oh, now, you don't like that, so let's jump down to verse 14. Verse 14 says, and the word 
became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You, you confuse. You say, well, you're talking about Jesus. He just says the word. All right, well, let's just go to John chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus is talking to his disciples, trying to encourage them because he knew that he would be crucified on a cross, buried in a grave, and resurrected. So he wanted to encourage their heart. So he says, he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's the first, that's verse 1. Y- y'all know the one that we typically read at funerals, right? But this is not a funeral. He's encouraging us. And watch him. He says, I, Jesus said unto them, I am the way. The truth and the life. Watch this. No one comes unto the Father except through me. Let me go on a little bit further. Watch this. Verse 7. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Watch Thomas in verse 8. Philip, I'm sorry, saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. He said, he said, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Watch the next verse. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? I've been with you all this time, and you still don't know me. I've walked with you all of this time, and you still don't know me. He that has seen me, what? Has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Come on, watch this, verse 10. He said, believest thou not that I am in the Father? And the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth where? In me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am where? In the Father. And the Father is where? In me. Or else believest me for the works, the very works sake. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm already telling you that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if that's not enough for you, can you at least believe the miracles that I've done? The the, the wonders that I've performed? Come on, somebody. Watch this. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask, where in my name, that what will I do, that the Father may be glorified, how? In the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, holy, righteous, full of love, grace, mercy, truth. Jesus is omnipotent. Omniscient, omnipresent, holy, righteous, full of love, grace, and truth. And so the Father is in him, and he is in the Father. In another passage, he says, I believe it's John chapter 10, maybe John chapter 17, he says, I and the Father are one. So then, we see that Jesus and the Father is one. Jesus is in the Father, the Father is in Jesus. But then Paul says something to us in uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. You know what? Before I go, I want to go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Watch what he says. He says this, verse, verse, verse 26, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Watch what Paul says. Come on, tech. Galatians. He says, for ye are all what? Children of God. How? In who? You are all children of God. By faith in Christ Jesus. Watch 27. For as many are of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. God Almighty. There is neither what? Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female for ye are all what? One. Where? In Christ. So the operative phrase here is in Christ. But let me just do something real quick. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Let me just do something real quick. He says there is neither Jew nor Gentile. This word in Greek is ethnos, where our word ethnicity comes from. So he's saying for those of us who are in Christ, 
it makes no difference whether you're black. You're the son and the daughter of God. Makes no difference whether you're white. You're the son, you're the daughter of God. Doesn't matter whether you're Middle Eastern, whether you're Asian, don't matter even if we don't know who you are and where you come from. If you're in Christ, y'all not going to say amen in here. Oh, this is, this is a, a very racial or ethnic statement. He's saying it doesn't matter what your background is if you are in Christ. Paul, who was a Pharisee, who was very, very well versed in the scriptures, understood that in the old covenant, God demanded that the children of Israel would not intermix and intermingle with any other ethnicities or any other nations. But in the new covenant, God almighty, the cross was not just for black people. The cross was not. I wish I had somebody in here. The cross was for whosoever will let him come. I wish I had. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. And there are so many issues that we're experiencing, not only in our world, in our country, in our community, in our homes. If we would get this, then it would change how we view one another. It will change. Oh, my God. It will change how we see one another. Watch, watch verse 16 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Watch. He says, he says, look, at this point, we don't look at anybody based upon their flesh. Is that not what he says? Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. I'm not connected to you. I'm not related to you based up on your flesh. I don't have anything in common with you necessarily uh, because of your flesh. Watch him. He says, we even knew Jesus in the flesh. We physically spent time with him. We saw him, and, and, and we experienced his teaching and his voice and his presence. But he's saying, but we don't see him that way anymore. We didn't know him in the flesh, but now we don't see him in the flesh. I know this is real tough for you to get, but stick with me. I promise, I promise it'll bless us. We don't know Jesus after the flesh anymore. That is the challenge with most of us would-be Christians, so-called believers today. We're trying to know God in the flesh. And Paul has already told you in 1 Corinthians that the natural man, he or she cannot understand and know the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned. So you cannot know Jesus in the flesh. You have to get to know Jesus by faith in the spirit. And once we grab a hold of this, it will transcend so many of the other things that separates and divides us. I wish I had somebody in our flesh. Your flesh is dividing you. Your flesh won't let you embrace him. Your flesh won't let you embrace her. But when you recognize that that is a child, he is a child, she is a child of the living king, then it changes how you view your sister and how you view your brother. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. He says, we don't know him out of the flesh anymore. And this is why it makes sense. He says over in verse 17, he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, we're looking at him different. See, you, you thought this meant that they taught you at the old church. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have been passed away. Behold, all things have come new. We, we, we thought that meant that my old habits, my stank attitude. No, you can be in Christ and still have old habits and still have a stank attitude. Let me rephrase it. You can be saved and still have old habits and have a same attitude. No, no, that's not what went away. Sanctification and the power of the Holy Ghost drives that away. But what he's saying is once I recognize, Tanya, that you are a child of the king, I see you different. I, I look at you different. I handle you different. I treat you different once I see that you're in Christ. Is this making any sense? My old way of seeing people has gone away. And now my perception, my vision, is a whole new way of looking. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so you got the Father who is, and you got Christ who's in the Father, and he is. And then now, those of us who are saved, those of us who have trusted Christ through faith, received his grace and salvation, we are in him. I learned this this week. Watch Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, verse 3. Watch this. Paul said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places where? Watch verse 4. Verse 4 says, according as he hath chosen us where? 
oh God, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. Where? How? God Almighty. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who hath. That's a past tense term. I've taught you this before. God ain't doing no more blessing. I told you he is. I told you that he's omnipotent. I told you that he's omniscient and he's omnipresent. So everything God started, he finished at the same time. So your blessing and your breakthrough is already done. He's already done it. You just through Christ and in Christ got to get to it. Are oh, you hear what I'm saying? So he has already blessed us. Your healing is already. Your, your blessing is already. Your, your breakthrough is already. I wish I had some folks in here who understood what I'm saying. He hath already blessed you. It's just taking time for your mind and your heart to agree with it. Because your flesh makes it difficult for you to agree with God. Because you're looking to feel like his word. I just don't feel blessed. Yeah, but faith just says you are. Faith supersedes what I feel when I don't even feel blessed, when I don't even feel love, when I don't even feel cared for. I know he loves me. I know he blesses me, cares for me. He says, God hath already blessed us in heavenly places where in Christ. Here it is. This is what I, this is what I learned. Um. Two natures. Two natures. Yeah, Brianna, you say, but you got two natures. Right? You have an Adamic nature. You have that fallen, depraved human nature that we all immediately received from Adam. And it's things in our nature that we don't even have to put there. They just are there. I ain't going to say amen. You, you know, you didn't teach, you didn't have to teach your child to lie. It was already in there. What you did was just taught them how to be good at it. Y'all ain't going to say amen. Answer the phone. Answer the phone. I don't even think that worked anymore because everybody got their own personal cell phone, so they know that your child is lying when you say she ain't here. Well, why is her phone there? You, you don't have to teach them how to be selfish. You don't have to teach them how to be jealous. You don't have to teach them how to do any of that. It is inherent in their nature. It is inherent in our nature. And we inherit all of that from our father, Adam. But then, those of us who are believers, blood-washed, born-again believers, we have a new nature. A Christ-like nature. And here's the thing, you received your Adamic nature at birth, your physical, natural birth. When your mama was at JPS and screamed and squeezed you out, you came out with all of that messed up stuff from Adam. Are you hearing me? So you got your nature from Adam from your natural birth. But, but Jesus said to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, he said, Nicodemus, verily, verily, I say unto you, except the man be born again. God Almighty. He cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, man, I don't get it. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he go back to JPS? Can he go back to the NICU? Can he go back to his mother's womb a second time? Jesus didn't even respond to the nonsense that Nicodemus' flesh presented. He just said, Nicodemus, except the man be born of the water and what? The spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. What I'm saying to you is when we become born again, we receive a new nature. A spiritual nature we become those who are in Christ God Almighty and when you become in Christ those of us who have our eyes enlightened the eyes of our understanding enlightened so we have the revelation and the knowledge of who Jesus is we understand that when God Almighty we were born of the Spirit we got everything he got Oh. The way I learned it was like this. You don't have to get it. If you're in him, you already got it. That should have set somebody on a course. 
to be destructive in the kingdom of, of, of Satan, you don't have to get it. You already got it. You, you already have the, in him, you have the authority. In him, you have the power. In him, you have deliverance. You have freedom. You have wholeness. You have completeness. You have boldness. You have confidence. It's all in him. I wish I had somebody in here who could jump up and say, I already got it. Devil, you've been trying to convince me that this is how it's going to be. You've been trying to convince me that I will lose. But devil, I'm here to tell you, I've already got the victory. In him, I've already got it. Woo! Already got it. And that would be cool and something that I could continually shout about, except I got a problem. And that is, though I have this new nature, I unfortunately still have. <laughs> oh, y'all in here with me now. And it creates a problem and natural inconveniences because my old nature is not compatible, God Almighty, with my new nature. I, I wish I had somebody. My, my old nature has me thinking, acting, and being one way. But my new nature has me thinking and acting and being another way. And the problem with most of us, we are picky and choosy about which nature we're going to let come up. Oh, oh I, I'm talking real now. I'm, I'm preaching to you now. So, 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 so the old nature would say, yeah, just go ahead and blast her on social media. But the new nature says, you need to just pray about it. See, it's naturally inconvenient for you to get your vengeance and to be faithful to God. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, see, if we'd all be honest, you had that problem on your way here in traffic today. Both them natures working. I ain't going to tell y'all who it was, but, but, but I think she was confessing. I ain't no priest, but I think she was confessing. It was a person, a young lady told me she was on her way to work. And say a man tried to cut her off, but she sped up and then the man shot her a finger and said, I see you. And she said, before she knew it, Adam then rose up. I see you too. <laughs> yeah, be honest about it. All right, since, since we won't be honest, I thank God that the Apostle Paul was willing to be. So if you go, come on to Romans chapter 7. Come on, watch this. We've read this before. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. And I want to I wanna look at it in the, in, in the, the message Bible because Paul says, he said, I'm going to be honest. Since y'all acting like y'all so holy and sanctified and you ain't never tempted to cuss, you ain't never tempted to lie, you ain't never tempted to steal, you ain't never tempted to lust, I wish I had some. Paul says, I'll tell you what. He says, I, I, I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual. I understand that. He's talking about the law. I know, I know the law is spiritual. He says this, but I'm not. He said, in my old nature... Ain't nothing spiritual about all this. But Paul tell the truth. Y'all won't, but he will. He says, he says, isn't this also your experience? If, if, if Paul says, can I get one witness? Is it just me or is it you too? Right? He, he, says, he says, yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. Man, I'm so good at it, right? Man, I'm, I'm trying. Boy, I'm, boy, look here. I'm so good at it. I ain't even got to say nothing. I just stand up there and look at her. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to say amen. You good at your boy, stop. <laughs> You've been there so long. You it's, it's involuntary. It's just in there. You don't even think it before you know it. You done already. Y'all ain't going to say amen. He says, I've spent a long time in sin's prison, but what I don't understand about myself, since I can't talk about you, is that I decide one way. But then I act another. Doing things I absolutely despise. God Almighty, you don't want nobody calling you a trick. 
a whoremonger? Male or female? You don't want anybody. So why are you doing the stuff that tricks whoremongers and prostitutes do? He said, the stuff I despise, I usually don't do this. Y'all have said it before. I done lied and said it before. Me and Paul are going to tell the truth this morning. He says, I despise it. So, so if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's commands are necessary. It becomes obvious that this new nature in this new way is necessary because I can't trust me. You, that's, you, that's been most of our challenge and problem all along. We've been trusting us. And, and, and you have not even been faithful to you. We've let ourselves down over and over and over again. So we've proven to ourselves who we are. And, and, and I think it was Maya Angelou says, when somebody show you who they are, believe them. See, we want to have this best view of ourselves in the flesh. We want to think of ourselves as so, such and much. But I'm trying to tell you, you cannot be counted on. You cannot be trusted. You cannot be dependent. I'm talking to me. You cannot be counted on. You cannot be trusted. You've proven it over and over again. So he says, obviously, I can't trust myself. So that must mean God way. Is the better way and necessary. Watch this next verse. This next verse says this. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, if I know what's right in my flesh and this old nature can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, see, unless the sin is dealt with, it will undermine every effort and your be- you will mess it up. Do you not understand that, hey, everybody didn't kick you out and it was them? If you've been kicked out of place number A, place letter, letter B, place letter three, and you saying the same thing about all of the people who asked you to leave, at some point in time, it's not the people. You, you got to consider, could it just possibly be that I'm doing something wrong? I'm saying something, that's the last person we want. We want to blame everybody else for our lack of progress and our lack of advancement, but we never look at ourselves. Oh, God, they 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 just don't want to hire nobody black. Sucker, you ain't even qualified. You didn't even. Oh, y'all hear what I'm saying? See, that's what flesh will do. Flesh will make excuses. Watch this now. He says, obviously, obviously I need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes in my flesh. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. Verse 18 says, I decide not to be bad, to do bad, but then I do it anyway. God, that sounds like my life. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong where? Deep within me and gets the better of me every time. Paul is saying, you had not figured out that there's two natures in there. That's naturally inconvenient. Watch verse 19. Watch him. Verse 19 says, it happens so regularly that it's predictable. I already know what I'm going to do. If I be honest with myself and I'm walking and moving in the flesh, I already know how I'm going to handle it. I already know what I'm going to say. I already know how I'm going to treat him. He says, it's, it's, it's predictable now, right? It happens so regularly, it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trap me up, trip me up. I truly delight in God's command. I, I, I mean, it's a great idea. It sounds good every time I hear it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Wow, what a noble idea. But the problem is, when it comes time to genuinely show love to my neighbor, even when my neighbor don't deserve to be loved, 
I get tripped up every time. I get tripped up on his attitude. I get tripped up on the way she dressed. I get tripped up on, I wish I had somebody, uh, up on their race and their ethnicity. I get tripped up because they're a woman. I get tripped up because they're a man. I just can't do it. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me does. Uh-oh. There's this thing called bias and subjectivity. And Paul is saying, as, as saved as I am, somewhere inside of me is a mm. <laughs> I just love it when the word just digs right all up in our kitchen and get into our stuff. We can't even talk. We can't say anything. He says, look, he says, it's, it's just that predictable. And not all of me joins in that delight. It sounds good. It sounds good. To say love your neighbor as yourself. It sounds good to say things like, well, you know, I don't see color. That is a spiritually immature statement. Because a mature person would say, I see color and I see it every day. The only difference is I'm subscribing to my new nature. And my new nature helps me to think properly, to feel properly, and to act properly concerning the color that I see. But my immaturity causes me to hide behind empty statements like, I don't see color. But that was too hard. All right, let me go back to what I was saying. Because it's naturally inconvenient. He says, parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they take charge. God Almighty. It is no denying the fact that Men of color are suffering an improportionate, and I don't even know if anybody should suffer any of this at all, period, but when it comes to police brutality, when it comes to our lives being taken from us because somebody else is subscribing to the old nature, it is a known fact that black men are an endangered species in the United States of America. God Almighty. And, and I'm going to say this, and I don't care who hears it. A spiritually immature person, when they hear someone says black lives matter, they'll spurt out all lives matter. Because the thing that's inside of them, covertly rebelling against this concept, allows them to scream and retort to black lives matter, all lives matter. And their immaturity won't let them see that the only reason why the idea and philosophy of black lives matter is put forth is to simply say that all lives cannot matter until black lives matter. So all lives mattering is a lie as long as black lives do not matter. Brown lives do not matter. Boy, that's somebody should have shouted right there. So it's it's naturally inconvenient to be honest about what's happening in our world. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This sermon just took a little spin. It's naturally inconvenient because, because watch this. Some of us, as long as we were seeking justice in the Amber Geiger case, we stepped in it now. As long as we were seeking justice, as long as we were praying, I mean, I'm seeing people praying for justice, right? And I'm not saying that they're wrong. I'm just simply saying, but however, when forgiveness was on the table, it naturally became inconvenient. Or, or, or there were some of us who were celebrating the forgiveness but as long as justice was fleeting from us, evading us, we were silent because it was naturally what? But but those of us who are in Christ, we seek both justice and forgiveness. They're not mutually exclusive. I don't even know why I'm talking about this right now. They are not mutually exclusive. You can have justice and have forgiveness. Let me tell you, let me tell you, Christ proved it on the cross. God Almighty. Because you should have been 
dying and going to hell. You should have been. I wish I had somebody. But justice said, wait a minute. Okay, I done got excited right there. What verse am I on? Uh, somebody said I finished it. I did because I'm saying, Justice, watch this. Let me read a little bit further and I'll connect that with the cross. Watch this. He says, I tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything to help me with these inconveniences? Isn't that the real question? Isn't that the real question? Who is going to help me when I'm tempted to lie about this? Who's going to help me when we're on the mancation in Panama? I mean, they pass it out in Panama. I done been there. And I was good. I had the Holy Ghost helping me like, pow, no, pow. <laughs> Stiff arm and that. Don't even know why I'm talking about that, but... I'm saying this is real talk. Who's going to help me when I'm about to make this Twitter post? I'm about to make this Instagram post. I'm about to make this Facebook post. And it's really coming from my covert nature, that thing that's deep down inside of me that is racist, that is prejudice, that is bigotry. God Almighty. And all of that stuff comes from fear. It comes from fear of being replaced, fear from being eliminated, fear from being subjected to some other human, some other people. But there is no fear in Christ. Amen. Let me just finish reading, then we'll pray. Are you all right? I thank God Paul gives the answer. He says, the answer, thank God, is Jesus Christ can and does. He can help us, and he does help us. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions. Jesus is the one who settled all of these natural inconveniences. He says, where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influences of my favorite news channel. Left, right, blue, white, or green, anything in between. I'm pulled by my influences. I'm going to stop right here. Of sin to do something totally different. I got one more verse I should have. Is that it? Yeah, okay, that's it. The point that I'm making is when we realize that we are in Christ, we don't have to get anything. We already have it. And then over in Galatians, Paul says, says, those of us who are in Christ were sons and children of God, and we have put on Christ. So being in him means that his ways, his nature is accessible and available to us. But when we put on Christ and we're clothed with him, that means we act the way he would act. This is when WWJD really, really comes into effect. What would Jesus do? When we put on Christ, we think the way he would think. We feel the way he would feel. And when we put on Christ, then we're able to activate the power of the Holy Ghost to change our lives. And until we figure that out, we will be living these lives of contradictions where all things are naturally inconvenient. Was this a blessing to anybody today? I